So first of all, I want to say thank you very much to the organisers for allowing me to present today at this conference. Um, so what I'm going to do today is give a whistle-stop tour of some work we've been doing to develop a new questionnaire for assessing hearing. So you're probably wondering whether we need another self-report questionnaire to measure hearing status and hearing aid benefit, as there are already so many of these out there, and I've given a few examples here. Um, and what these questionnaires usually entail is getting the patient to rate their ability to hear in a typical day-to-day -day scenario. And you can see from these examples here, which I think is it's taken from the AFAB, uh, for example, um, when I'm in a crowded grocery store, talking to the cashier, I can, I can follow the conversation. And they rate that without hearing aids or with hearing aids. Now, one of the main problems with these tools relates to their accessibility, which is, of course, a particular focus of this uh, part of, of the conference. And, for example, most of these questionnaires are, are written in English, and they typically require a decent level of literacy in order to understand the written instructions, as well as the, the individual items within that questionnaire, and the rating scales for each of the, of the individual items as well. And another problem relates to how individuals interpret each of these written statements. So, for example, there could be a question like, how well can you hear in a noisy bar? So for one person, they might imagine it to look a bit like this. For others, it might look a bit like this. For me, it's probably a bit like this, and so on. So therefore, each person will have their own idea of what noisy is and how well they think they can hear in that situation, which can add a lot of variability to individual items within a questionnaire. It makes it very difficult for, for the clinician to interpret scores as well. So what is a potential solution to these problems? Well, you're probably familiar with the saying, picture is worth a thousand words. So what we're wondering is whether we might be able to capture difficult listening scenarios using pictures rather than words, which would help to overcome some of the language and literacy barriers that I pointed out on the previous slide, and also help to standardize the listening scenarios for all participants. So let's take a look at this example here. You're walking down the road looking for a nice place to eat and you stroll past this restaurant window. And without even being able to hear the noise coming from inside the restaurant, you'll be able to make a judgment on how noisy it will be in there. For example, based on the number of people dining, the layout of the restaurant, the types of services, and all these different factors that you're going to take into consideration. So for someone with hearing loss, they might decide that they would not be able to hear and communicate in this sort of setting just from looking at it. And they'll probably just continue to walk past and find somewhere else. It looks a little bit quieter for them to dine. So the aim of the project I'm going to briefly present today was to develop and validate an image-based questionnaire in which written descriptions used in traditional questionnaires are replaced by images or photographs, similar to what you've seen in the previous slides. So the first experiment in this project was to identify which day-to-day -day listening scenarios we wanted to include within our questionnaire and which images best depict those scenarios. So where previous questionnaires don't seem to be based on any particular framework for their items, and these seem to be selected quite arbitrarily, we decided to use the common sound scenario framework as the basis of our questionnaire. So this includes scenarios involving communication, such as talking with one person in a quiet place, or a group of people in a noisy place, uh, involves active listening, so for example, watching television or listening to music, and also more passive listening as well. So for example, just noticing sounds around you, either in a quiet or a noisy place. And as you can see, there's 14 of these scenarios in total. So for each of the 14 scenarios, as a team, we selected six photos of each one, and we selected these from Shutstock, and these are the ones that we thought best depicted that given scenario. So in this particular example here, talking with a group of people in a quiet place, these are the six different photos that we selected. So then what we did was we recruited 71 participants with and without hearing loss to rate each of these individual items for each of the cost scenarios. We wanted them to rate how well they would hear in each of these six pictures for each individual scenario, of which there's 14 in total. So one thing you'll note is that the rating scale uses a thumbs down, thumbs up kind of anchor to either end of the rating scale. And this was off the back of some patient and public involvement activities that we did at the very, very beginning of this project. Uh, and the, the members of this group suggested that we could use visual anchors instead of words to further reduce the amount of text included on individual items. So this study was conducted on uh, online using lab plans. So not only did we get the participants to rate how well they think they would hear in each of the individual items, we also asked them to select which of the items they thought best captured that individual scenario. Um, and they could select up to three. So for each of the individual cost frameworks, for each of 14, um, the two photographs that were most often selected by participants and with similar ratings to each other were taken forward 
for the next part of the experiment. So in the second experiment, we wanted to back validate the images that we selected from experiment one to make sure that we had indeed captured what we thought we were meant to be capturing. So we recruited 42 participants and they were shown 28 selected images. So that's two for each of the individual COS um, items. And we asked them to type into the free text box what we thought they would be trying to hear or trying to listen to if they were in that particular scenario. So in this example we've got here, um, we'd be looking for something along the lines of talking on the phone in a noisy place, which aligns with that particular cause item. And then we scored each item in terms of correctly identifying the key cause elements. And then the image that was most often described correctly from the two for each cause item was taken for, forwards to the final 14 item IBQ. And again, all these procedures were conducted online using MathLabs. In the next experiment, we wanted to validate the IBQ in terms of its ability to detect hearing loss and to determine whether participants preferred, found easy to complete, and were more confident in completing the IBQ in comparison to text-based equivalents, so the written um, COS scenario, and also compared to um, a validated hearing questionnaire. So we used the Glasgow Hearing and Benefit Profile Questionnaire. And again, all the procedures were conducted on that advanced. And then following that, um, we asked participants to complete the anti-basic digits and noise test online by a custom built bit of software. So we hypothesized that correlations between the IBQ and the digits and noise thresholds would be as good as, or if not better than, correlations with standard questionnaires and the, the digits and noise. So in this case, the Glasgow uh, questionnaire and also the text-based equivalent that we, we've um, generated from, from the uh, COS framework. Um, we also hypothesized that people would prefer to complete the IBQ, they find it easier to use and they'd be more confident in completing it compared to the text-based equivalent. So we found that, um, well, all three were correlated with digits and noise thresholds, um, but as you can see, the IBQ was um, slightly better, had a slightly stronger correlation with digits and noise than the other two um, questionnaires that we included, but the correlations between these different questionnaires was not significant. Different. What's most telling perhaps is that um, overall people did prefer um, the IBQ, they found it easy to complete, and they were more confident in answering the IBQ compared to the text-based equivalent. So you can see this in the uh, yellow bars in this bottom right figure. So, so far so good. We're feeling pretty confident that the IBQ is a good alternative to some of the other hearing questionnaires that are already out there, and it goes some way to addressing the language and literacy barriers that we identified earlier on. But there's still work to be done. In the next study, we aim to test face validity of the IBQ by assessing it against participants' pure tone audiometric thresholds, as opposed to online digits and noise thresholds that, we, that we've done in experiment three. Um, at the same time, we will assess its test retest reliability to get participants to complete uh, the IBQ at two different time points separated by a couple of weeks. And we want to look at the individual items of the IBQ and, and subscales according to the, the cost framework to assess content validity of the IBQ. A little bit further down line, we also need to assess whether it's sensitive to detecting changes in hearing in terms of both hearing loss over time and also hearing aid benefit. And we also need to assess the feasibility, practicability and acceptability of administering the IBQ in a clinical setting for both audiologists and patients. If you want to take a look at the IBQ items for yourself, you can do so using this QR code here. I'll leave that up for a second. And that's all I want to say today. Um, I'll leave the QR code up there so you can check out the IBQ if you want to. Uh, I think the last thing for me to do is to thank you for listening. Also, thanks to my collaborators and funders. I'm very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Although I should point out that it was actually my colleague, Manu Perugia, who is a postdoc researcher on this project, who did most of the data collection and analysis. So he's probably better placed to answer some of these questions. So any tricky ones that I get, I will refer on to him. And I'll get him to email. Okay, thanks everyone.